Yeah. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Ron Payne. I'm president of the Odyssey Audubon Society, and uh, uh, we have these uh, annual um, presentations every year. We call our Cabin Fever Lecture Series. We have uh, three a year. Our next one will be in February, again, the second uh, Thursday of the month. It will be Hank Kastner, who's actually sitting right here, um, <laughs> talking about a trip he took to Kazakhstan, um, birding there. And uh, uh, I'd also like to mention that this Saturday, we have our monthly wildlife walk at Otterview Park and the Herd Grassland. And it's supposed to be a little warmer than today, so it won't be too terrible. <laughs> um, is uh, Sarah Zahendra, field biologist from uh, Vermont Center for Eagle Studies. Uh, and you may have heard her on VPR. Um, what do they call your show? Um, outdoor Radio. Outdoor Radio, yeah, with Ken McFarland. It's an really enjoyable little, little bit. Um, so uh, without further ado, uh, Sarah Zahendra on Bumblebees. <laughs> All right. So I have been working at the Vermont Center for Eco Studies for about five years now. And in case you don't know who we are and what we do, um, we are a small but growing nonprofit who um, we do conservation work. And we're based in Norwich, Vermont. And we do all sorts of different things. We work on loon conservation. We work on um, research on montane songbirds. We do mapping of vernal pools. We lead the Mountain Bird Watch every year. Um, and of course, we also do work with insects. We did the Vermont Butterfly Survey, um, and we've got an entire atlas of all the butterflies of Vermont. And then we did the Vermont Bumblebee Survey. And I have worn a lot of hats at VCE over the past five years, but what I have spent my, most of my time on and what I have loved the most is the work that I've done on the Vermont Bumblebee Survey. Um, so this was a two-year atlas, and sort of the guiding principle of this atlas was to document the relative abundance and distribution of all species of bombus, which are bumblebees, as well as something called the, the Xylocopa virginica, or the eastern carpenter bee, across the state of Vermont. So basically what that is, is we wanted to know what species of bumblebee we have here and where they are. Simple as that. And so later on, I'll tell you a little bit about what we found in the two years of our survey. But first, I want to talk about, oh, let's see, there we go. What is a bee in the first place? So we're going to take several steps back, not even what is a bumblebee yet, but what is a bee? All right. A bee is an insect and it is in an order called Hymenoptera. Now, this insect order, Hymenoptera, includes all species of ants, bees, and wasps. And all bees are evolved from a common wasp-like ancestor. So first came the wasps, then evolved the bees. So what's the difference then? Like when you're sitting in your garden, you're watching all these stinging things flying around and land on your flowers, what's the difference between a bee and a wasp? The main difference is the, the protein source that they feed to their offspring. All bees feed pollen as a protein source to their offspring. Um, and of course, as soon as I say that, you can Google it and find all the exceptions to what I just said. Um, but most of them, for the most part. On the other side are the wasps. And they almost always feed carrion, or meat, to their offspring as a protein source. So what this means is that bees have a lot of pollen-carrying adaptations, a lot of morphological differences that you can see that help them carry pollen. And the main one that bees are kind of famous for is hair, right? They've got branched hairs that are shaped sort of like this that pollen grains can lodge in. And different bee species have it on different parts of their body. Some of them have it on the, the lower part of their abdomen. Some of it have it on their thorax. But of course, my favorite, the bumblebee, has something called a corbicula. This corbicula, which we, we call saddlebags sometimes, is on their hind legs in an area called the tibia. And it is a, a smooth concave portion. And it is surrounded by these branched hairs. And so what a bumblebee will do as it's foraging in your garden is it's going to gather pollen. And it's going to mix it with saliva and with nectar. And it, it's going to stick it in these, um, in these corbicula, or these saddlebags, into something that we call a pollen loaf. And so it can take these pollen loaves back to the colony and feed it to their offspring as the protein source. So that's, that's the corbicula, and that's how bumblebees get their protein to their offspring. 
And, you know, I, I told myself not to go off on this tangent, but <laughs> here I go, because this is one of the many mind-blowing things I'm going to tell you about bumblebees. Um, they have done some recent research into why bees are such fantastic pollinators. And what they found is it has, part of it has to do with electrostatic charge. Flowers are slightly negatively charged. Bumblebees, as they fly through the air, build up a slightly positive charge. So they land on a flower, they don't even have to come into contact with the anther to pollinate the flower because the pollen grains, because of that difference in charge, will <coughs> jump onto the hair of the bee, which they then take back to their offspring. So that's one of the reasons they're such fantastic pollinators, is the difference in electrostatic charge. And one last thing about this, those hairs that you see right there, they are actually an extension of the insect exoskeleton. So they're not hair like we have, they're just made of chitin, very soft chitin. Okay, a word about honeybees. Um, honeybees and bumblebees are different. They're in the same family called Apis, but they're in completely different genuses. Um, Apis mellifera is the European honeybee. They are a domesticated, non-native animal in the Western Hemisphere. They were brought over here to the New World in about 1620, and that was done in order to help us pollinate our crops. And they've done a fantastic job of it. Um, they are highly generalist, highly successful foragers to the point that they compete with our native bees for resources, right? That stands to reason they were introduced, they don't belong here, and they compete because they're very, very successful. They also tend to carry diseases, that they, novel diseases a lot of times, that our native species don't have, um, don't have any way of stopping of getting into their system, and they, they have given them to a lot of our native species of bees. The other thing I want to say about the honeybees is people hear a lot about um, colony collapse disorder, right? So that is a term that applies, really applies only to Apis mellifera, or the honeybee. So the particular components that make up colony collapse disorder, the pesticides, the pathogens, all of those, some of them do affect bumblebees and other native species, but that whole terminology about colony collapse disorder is really particular to the European honeybee. All right, bee diversity and distribution. There are about 20,000 species of bee on the planet. Um, 270 species here in Vermont, I'm gonna go ahead I'm going to go out on a limb and say there's actually 300, um, several that we haven't even discovered yet. They tend to be most diverse in Mediterranean ecosystems. Kind of counterintuitive, right? You think areas of really high diversity, you think the Amazon basin, the tropics, things like that. Not so for bees. If you look here um, at all these red spots, the Mediterranean basin, California, northern Baja, those are hot spots for bee diversity. And now, to the best part, all bumblebees all the time. Okay, bumblebee diversity distribution. There are only 250 species of bumblebee worldwide, so that's opposed to 20,000 species of bee. They're most diverse in temperate climates, not Mediterranean, not tropics. So, I think if you think Julie Andrews in The Sound of Music, right, on those rolling hills with all the flowers blowing in the wind, that is your quintessential bumblebee habitat. Lots of flowers. Um, if you look here on the map, all these red spots, or orange spots, are the areas of highest bumblebee diversity. So we're looking at places like Switzerland, like the Himalayas, um, China. If you look right here, that 65. That is the bumblebee hotspot of the world. It's in the Sichuan province in China. Um, they used to have 65 species there. I could pretty much guarantee that they don't have that many now because they too are experiencing bumblebee declines. Um, but they still have many, many species there. Um, we're not doing too bad. In northeastern North America, we have about 33 species. And we used to have 17 species historically in Vermont. Now, that number 17 is kind of up for debate. Um, two of those 17 are probably vagrants, only found one or two specimens here in Vermont. So let's say, conservative, we had 15 species of bumblebee here in Vermont. We now only have 12. 
All right, let's meet the cast. Um, this is a little chart to give you an idea of the members of the colony, the cast members of this family. And it uses a comparison with the honeybees, but we're just going to ignore the honeybees for right now. Okay, type of adult bee, queen bee. What does it do? She lays eggs, and that's about it. How many in a bumblebee colony? There is one. And what does she look like? She's big, she's fuzzy, and she stings, and it hurts a good bit but not as bad as a wasp. All right, type of adult bee, a worker. What do they do? They do everything, what their name implies. They take care of the larvae, they build, they clean, they forage, they defend. Everything that needs doing for the colony, the worker bees do it. How many in a bumblebee colony? Less than 50 to over 400, up to 1,000. It depends on a lot of things, the species, um, the conditions that year whether they have a lot of resources. What do they look like? They basically look like a small version of the queen bee, and they also sting. Type of adult bee, male. What does he do? Very little. Um, he leaves the nest and mates and dies. How many are there in a bumblebee colony? Between zero and 50, also depending on all of the things I mentioned before. And what do they look like? There's sort of an intermediate size between the queen bee and the worker bee. They tend to be really hairy, so I think of them as the hairy males. And here's the best part, they do not sting. So um, a really fun party trick, if you can tell the difference between the ones that sting and they don't, is grabbing a bumblebee. People will think you're very cool, unless you get it wrong, <laughs> which um, my boss has actually done before. Very amusing. Okay. Um, I want to spend a good bit of time on the life cycle of the colony because I think this is really integral to understanding bumblebees. I'm going to start down here in the springtime, even though um, it doesn't look much like spring outside right now. When the days start to get longer and it starts to get warmer and a few flowers come out, a queen bee will crawl out of an abandoned rodent hole in the ground. She has been in torpor for the entire winter. So she's lowered her metabolic rate, her heart rate, her heart rate, she barely breathes at all, and she has spent the entire winter underground. Previous to this, in the fall, she mated, and she stored that sperm in something called a spermatheca, and she has been carrying that with her underground all winter long. So she comes out of the rodent hole, and the first thing she wants to do is eat, right? She's very, very hungry. So all of those early springtime blooms, like rhododendrons, willows, even dandelions, really, really important for those queen bees. So she eats, and then the next thing she does, she finds a suitable nest site. Lots of different places that bumblebees can start a colony. Um, one of their favorites is an abandoned rodent hole. Not the same one in which they overwinter, but a lot of them use rodent holes. Um, a lot of them will use the insulation of your house if they get the chance. I get a lot of calls in the spring about that. Um, some of them will even nest on top of the ground. They will just pull some thatches of grass up over the beginning of their colony, and as it grows, they'll keep pulling grass up over the, the, the new colony members. Um, this creates a bit of a problem, you might imagine, with mowing, right? So if you mow, accidentally you can take out a lot of colonies of bumblebees. So she finds a good nest site. The next thing she does is, this is my favorite part, she makes furniture. She starts to exude wax from in between her abdominal segments. Then she scrapes that wax off and starts to form pieces of furniture with it. First thing she makes is a nectar pot in which she stores um, nectar. The second thing she does is she makes cells for her first brood. And if you look up here, Two years ago, we were lucky enough to find the very big beginnings of a Bombus griseocolis nest right on the ground. Um, that's the honey pot right there. Those are the cells for the first brood in which she lays her eggs. We actually um, stuck our pinkies in the little nectar pot and tasted the nectar. It is like sugar water. And then we were able to pull the grass back up over those two little structures and the queen bee crawled back in and continued. So, no bees were harmed in the taking of that photo. Um, so one of the things I want you to notice is that right there is the sum total of her first brood. So the first brood is really, really small, and it takes time for a colony to get going. That's only four to eight 
um, little cells in which she's going to lay eggs. So then she takes one of her pollen loaves, remember those things she carries in her saddlebags, she takes those pollen loaves, she stuffs them down cells, and then she crawls on top of it and shivers her wing muscles in order to incubate the eggs. That is the source of the buzzing that you hear when you hear a bumblebee. So it's not the wings you hear, it's the wing muscles, and it creates a whole lot of heat, enough to incubate her eggs for about four days. And after four days, they hatch out, and the larvae start to feed on that um, conveniently located pollen loaf. They will continue to grow and develop for different instars or phases of um, their larval development. And then after about two weeks, they are going to spin a cocoon and pupate. And then they're going to develop some more for about two weeks in that pupa. And then they hatch out into an adult bee that we call a callow. We call it a callow because its hair is completely white for the first 24 to 48 hours. And then the color comes in, and then it leaves the nest and starts to forage. Start to finish, egg to adult bumblebee leaving the nest is four to six weeks. And that depends, of course, on species, resources, weather, all sorts of different things. So what's really important to remember now is that that first brood, most of the subsequent broods throughout the beginning towards the middle of the summer are all going to be worker, non-reproductive bees from, uh, from fertilized eggs. Worker, non-reproductive from fertilized eggs. So she continues to lay eggs and they build structures and the workers start to forage and they help build structures and the colony grows. And then at some point, usually late in the summer, the queen does something funny. She starts to lay unfertilized eggs that hatch out into reproductive male drones. Right around that time, she lays eggs that are destined to become the next year's queen. And I'll tell you right now, we don't know what makes a bumblebee queen. So I know with, um, with honeybees, it's royal jelly, right? They, they feed the larva royal jelly and that bee becomes a queen. With bumblebees, we have no idea. So yet another thing that we need to find out about bumblebees. So she's laying these eggs that will become the drones. She's laying eggs that will become the queen bees. The drones leave. They get kicked out of the nest. They go find a queen bee from a different colony with which to mate. Never return. And what's fun about this is late fall, late summer, early fall, what you can do if you have those big sunflowers, if you go out early in the morning and flip them over, a lot of times you will find tons of male bees hanging out there because it's warm, it's safe, um, they can all group together, and there's food right there. So that's always something fun that you can do. And they're the ones that you can catch and not get stung. So, um, so right about this time, the colony starts to disband and the members start to die off. Um, the workers and the males have a very short lifespan, and um, they are predated on. They get killed by lots of different things out in nature. Um, the queen bee... She, the, the main queen bee that's been running this entire colony, she eventually dies off. And then the only ones left at the end of all of this are the new queens. So what they do as it starts to get cold again and all the flowers start to die is they find a nice abandoned hole. They crawl in, they go into torpor, and then they start the whole cycle over again in the spring. So that is the colony cycle of the bumblebee. Haplodiploid sex determination in bumblebees. <laughs> this is my favorite genetics lesson ever, but I will not subject you all to it in its entirety. Um, I'm going to go over this really quickly. I'm just going to touch on the basics, but please ask me questions about it afterwards because I'd love to talk more about genetics. So with haplodiploid animals, and all of, ha all of Hymenoptera are haplodiploid, the females are all diploid, they have two chromosomes, and they come from a fertilized egg. The males are all haploid, they have one chromosome, and they come from an unfertilized egg. So you've got the queen over here, she lays an unfertilized egg. If the queen mates with a drone, and she lays a fertilized egg, she ends up with these worker bees. For the purposes of staying simple, let's just talk about the worker bees from the fertilized eggs and not the other queens. So you end up with these sister bees in the colony. They are, on average, 75% related to each other. 
it's kind of weird, right? I am on average 50% related to my brother, and that's the best it can be, right? We're only 50% related to our, our um, siblings. And so these, these bees have an increased degree of relatedness. Why do I even mention this? Well, for two reasons. First of all, researchers think that this is part of the reason that colonial insects are colonial in the first place. If you think about it, the whole reason for life in this bumblebee colony is to get their genetics out into the environment. Well, the best way for these worker bees to do that is to tend to their sisters, because their sisters are potentially 75% related to them. They could have their own offspring from a fertilized egg, but their offspring are only going to be 50% related to them. So that is one of the reasons they think that these bees are willing to never reproduce, instead to tend to their sisters for their entire life. The, got 75%. Oh, I knew you were going to ask that question. Um, you're gonna ha I'm going to have to tell you at the end, because it's kind of long, and I don't want everyone to go to sleep. <laughs> but it's fascinating. It really is. <laughs> um, OK, so the other reason I mention this is because it leads to something called an extinction vortex. So when people hear about numbers of insects declining, they all, they all say, oh, you know, no big deal. They can just lay a ton of eggs and they'll be fine. Not so with hymenopterans. Long story short, again, I can explain it later. Um, what ends up happening when the genetic pool starts to shrink is that you end up with triploid sterile males. And this happens really, really fast, exponentially, and populations of bees can crash really, really quickly when genetic diversity becomes small. So that's the two reasons I talk about that. All right, on to the world of social parasites. This is a group of birders, right? Mm -hmm. Well, just like in the bird world, um, there are social parasites in the bumblebee world. These are bumblebees that lay their eggs in the nests of hosts, and then they kill or subjugate the host queen and enslave the workers. And then they'll control the host workers for the entire life of that colony through aggression and pheromones. Now, before you get too angry at these sweet little parasites, and that's one of them, um, keep in mind that they have evolved for thousands or tens of thousands of years with their hosts. And so it never, they never parasitize their hosts to the point of extinction, right? Um, and if you look at this, this chart here, it's really fascinating because you have a host queen that comes out, say, um, early in the spring, and she starts her colony, or her colony gets going, and it isn't until that colony really gets going that the parasitic queen comes out so that she can take advantage of a colony when it's at its height. Um, the other thing I should mention about these little parasites is that they are obligate, so they have no way of starting a colony on their own. Many of them are not able to exude that wax from in between their abdominal segments, so they can't make the furniture. Um, they also don't have corbicula, so they have no way of getting large amounts of pollen back to their offspring. That's why they have to enslave the workers of the host species. Um, so what they're lacking in sort of homemaking skills, they definitely make up for in aggression. These guys tend to be much more aggressive than, um, than the regular bumblebees. And these are all in a particular genus. So all the scytheris tend to be much more aggressive. Um, they have a rock hard exoskeleton. So if they get into a fight with the host queen, the host queen can't get her stinger through the exoskeleton of that one. Um, they have a much bigger venom sac. I can attest to that personally. Um, and they have something called a recurved abdomen. So most bumblebees have abdomens that sit sort of like this, car curve a little bit down, but those parasitic species have abdomens that are curved like a C, which makes it easier for them to sting. So that is the word, world of bumblebee social parasites. When I think of bumblebees and flowers, I like to think of these sweet, mutualistic relationships where the bumblebee lovingly goes to the flower and happily pollinates it um, because it loves the flower. And that's not true at all, obviously, right? Um, these are herbivores, right? They are going to that plant in order to eat parts of it. And 
pollination is simply incidental. They never do it on purpose. And a lot of times, believe it or not, they don't do it at all. Now the reason for this is they will forage as thieves or robbers. Sometimes they will gather plant oils and scents and resins from the outside of the plant, even from the stalk or from the leaves. Sometimes, here we'll start like this. There are long-tongued bees and there are short-tongued bees. If you are a short-tongued bee and you approach this bee balm here, it's very difficult to get your short tongue all the way down to the nectar bowl at the bottom. So what you do instead is you crawl around the outside of this flower and you rasp a hole in the base of it with your tongue and then you drink the nectar from back there. At which point you never come into contact with the anther. So you don't get pollen on you and you cannot pollinate another flower. So a lot of times, um, short-tongued bees, one of my favorites, Bombus tericola, if you, if you go out into fields of vetch, sometimes in the middle of the summer, and you look really, really closely at those vetch flowers, you will see holes rasped in every single one of them from these Bombus tericola that have stolen nectar. However, in a perfect world, this is how it's supposed to work. It's my favorite picture that Kent McFarland has ever taken with um, a little bee bum sticking out of a turtle head. <laughs> I have no idea what species that is. <laughs> habits and habitats. Bumblebees occupy a very wide array of habitats. Of course, they love flower-rich grasslands. That's their favorite. But you can also find them in agricultural settings because uh, they love clover or forest edges, you can even find them in wetlands. So basically anywhere that you can find a flower within two kilometers, you can find an entire colony of bumblebees. They tend to be generalist foragers. Uh, that said, there's a lot we don't know about flower preference in bumblebees. So most of the time, um, they will forage on purple or blue flowers if they can find them. However, they will, they will end up on dandelions. Um, dandelions actually, not all pollen is created equal. And so some flowers are missing particular amino acids that make it less nutritious for the bumblebee to forage on it, but they'll still forage on it if they have to. And it also doesn't seem to matter if something is native or introduced or even invasive. They love purple loosestrife. I know, it's sad, but they really do. They also have really flexible nesting strategies, like I mentioned before, uh, the insulation of your house, grassland areas right on top, abandoned rodent holes, just about anywhere that they could start a colony, they will. Despite all of this ecological plasticity that I've been talking about, a lot of species are declining. So what, how could that possibly be when they're generalists? I'm not going to go through this entire sad list of all the bumblebees that are declining in the Northeast, but I do want to turn your attention to this guy over here. Um, that is a Bombus affinis, or a rusty patch bumblebee. And that bumblebee is one of the main reasons that people started taking note of these bee declines. That was the fourth most common bumblebee in Vermont in the 1960s and 70s and even into the 80s. The last specimen of this bumblebee was found in 1999 in Vermont, and we have not seen it here since. And I actually have the last specimen over there. Um, it's experienced uh, declines in all of its former range, and it's actually, right now, you can only reliably find it at a couple of spots in Wisconsin. However, I will say, as an addition to this, this year we, we got a little bit of good news about this bumblebee. We think someone may have found a specimen in Maine. We're still checking to make sure. And somebody definitely found a specimen of this in Virginia this year. So it hadn't been in either of those places for 15, 16 years. And now we're starting to find them again. So it is possible that these bumblebees are coming back. If you look over here at Bombus ashtonii, this bumblebee is a parasite on this bumblebee and one other species, both of which are declining. So as the host species declines, that one has declined as well. So the parasitic species used to be found here in Vermont. We can't find it anymore and haven't found it for some time. Just to drive the point home, this is a graph of um, Bombaphinus, 1960s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and Kerput. Nothing after 1999. And you know, if you look at this range map right here, it's not like they were confined to one little spot in Vermont. They were found over the 
western portion of the state. All right, what is the evidence that we have for bumblebee declines? We have a lot, actually. Um, a lot of published reports and expert opinion from people who have been working with bumblebees for their entire lives, their entire careers. They've noticed a decline. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence from people who spend their lives working outside. They notice declines in bumblebees. I want to take a second to, to talk about museum collection data, because I know there are uh, a lot of there's a lot of arguments surrounding museum collections right now. But I will say one thing. If it were not for museum collection data, we wouldn't know the species that were missing. Um, Bombus affinis, we would have had no idea that it was the fourth most common bumblebee in Vermont if we didn't have those museum collection data to look at. Um, so, so that's one way in which they really have been helpful. However, we really don't have any baseline rigorous data sets from which to compare what we're finding now. Why are bumblebees declining? Somebody asked me this beforehand. What are we doing to bumblebees? You name it, we are doing it to kill bumblebees off. Climate change. There, like I said before, there's a lot we don't know about bumblebees. Some of them may have a very, very narrow climatic specialization that we just don't know about. And they are, they're dying because of climate change before we even know what they need. Another thing that's really important is emergence timing and mismatch with the food source. So you remember I said that those early spring flowers are really important for bumblebees, right? And so you can imagine a scenario in which those rhododendrons bloom two weeks early and then the queen bee comes out and she wants her rhododendrons and she doesn't have anything to forage on. Now that might not be immediately lethal, but it might impact her colony success and maybe she won't even be able to start a colony because of that. Lack of genetic diversity. Extinction vortex because they're haplodiploid, which I talked about a minute ago. Flawed assessment of abundance. Let's say I go out into the middle of this flower-rich grassland in July, and there are thousands of bees all around me. And I go, bees are doing great. This is fantastic. What you have to realize when you see that is the genetic diversity is held in only one of those bees in the queen. So all those bees that you see out there in that grassland, for the most part, those are workers. They don't breed, they don't reproduce, so there is no genetic diversity. That may be 500 bees, and the genetic diversity is held in one. So it isn't, it isn't okay to just go out and count bees and say, wow, we got a lot of bees. It's a little bit more complicated than that. Habitat change, loss, fragmentation. We know about urbanization, we know a lot about agricultural intensification, the fact that we're spraying things a lot now, um, the fact that we're using a lot more of our land on which to plant crops and not leaving little portions um, for native flowers to bloom and for bumblebees to forage on. Pesticides. Have you guys heard about neonicotinoids? Yeah, so this is a pretty big thing in the press right now. It is a relatively new set of systemic insecticides. Um, it goes oftentimes under the name of imidacloprid, um, where you can buy it you know, at Home Depot as imidacloprid. And these pesticides are not very lethal. They, they actually don't have an impact really on vertebrates, but they do on, um, on arthropods. Bees, as well as the moths and other things that people are trying to get with it. And so this, and I think this happened three years ago in Oregon. It was a big box chain, and they gave those neonicotinoids to their linden trees. And we don't actually know if it killed the moths that they intended to kill, but what we do know is that it killed 25,000 bumblebees from approximately 150 colonies. And it was a grisly scene. If you can imagine an entire parking lot just riddled with dead bees everywhere, that's about what it looked like. And then the last thing that's really interesting that's having an effect on bumblebee populations is pathogen spillover, novel parasites. And here's the story surrounding that. Bumblebees are by far the best pollinators of tomatoes on the planet. Honeybees don't hold a candle to them. Nothing does. And the reason is because they do something called buzz pollination or sonication. 
So they'll fly at a little tomato flower and they'll grab onto the petals with their legs and then they will vibrate their wing muscles at exactly the frequency necessary to dislodge the pollen from the anther of the tomato. Another mind-blowing bumblebee fact, right? Pretty spectacular. So the problem is there are not usually enough bumblebees when you need them, where you need them, in order to pollinate our commercial tomato crops. So in the 1980s, some gentlemen in Europe figured out how to breed bumblebees. They started to replicate the colony cycle. This was actually really hard to do. And when they figured out how to do it, they kept it a secret as long as they possibly could. And we here in the United States really needed more bumblebees. So we said, okay, 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 this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna take one of our native bumblebee species called Bombus impatiens. It is a hardy little bumblebee and very common here. We're gonna send you our queen bee. You're gonna breed her and breed her and breed her and breed her and then send us back all of these wonderful bumblebee colonies and little boxes like this. What could possibly go wrong, right? Well, as it turns out, tomato greenhouses in Vermont, you can see the little bumblebees coming out of the boxes, have bumblebees who wander. Why does that matter? Hmm? Well, here's why it matters. What we think happened is that while these Bombus impatiens were being bred in facilities in Europe, alongside native European bumblebees, they contracted a parasite. Now this parasite, a particular strain of Nosema bombi, was old news in Europe. Bumblebees had it all over the place. It ended up that it's a novel parasite to North America. So little Bombus impatiens contracted this novel parasite, brought it back over to the United States, got out of the greenhouses, and these parasites um, are spread through the feces of a bumblebee. They land on a flower, leave the parasite, and then another bee lands on the flower and contracts the parasite. Well, luckily, Bombus impatiens could survive with Nosema bombi pretty well. Didn't really have an impact on their populations. However, there were several bumblebees in a particular subgenus who did not seem to be able to handle Nosema bombi and all of their populations tanked right around the same time. Bombus affinis, the one that I was talking about, uh, about before that we don't see in Vermont anymore. Bombus tericola, another bumblebee whose, um, whose numbers completely tanked in 1999-2000. It's starting to come back a little bit. Um, Bombus occidentalis is a, west a western species. And Bombus franklini, this is a bumblebee who had I believe it was the smallest range of all bumblebees in the world, a little tiny area in Oregon. We haven't seen that bumblebee in 20 years, and so they are about to call it extinct, unfortunately. So that's pathogen spillover. So what are we gonna do about it, right? Um, Kent McFarland saw all of this doom and gloom, and he said, you know what, we don't even know what our bumblebees in Vermont are. We should. We should, at the very least, know what we have. So he started the Vermont Bumblebee Survey. Where are the bumblebees? What species do we have? That was our guiding principle. However, we did have some other little goals down here. Um, we wanted to assemble data and maps about the historic and then the present populations of Vermont bumblebees. We wanted to get that baseline data that is so critical so that 20 years from now, 50 years from now, people who are studying bumblebees and wondering where they all went we'll know what species we had. Uh, we wanted to assess the conservation status of the bumblebees that we do have, and we wanted to know what habitats are they in, so we could figure out and maybe try and protect what we do have. And then, last but not least, we wanted to educate and involve more people in uh, conserving bumblebees. That has been the toughest sell of them all. So bumblebees, um, they're no panda. Right? They're not even butterflies, so it's, it's kind of hard to get people to like them because they sting, but I think people are actually showing a more interest in them and in their declines than they used to be, I hope. What did we accomplish in our two years of this survey? We ended up with 10,000 bumblebee records comprised of 12 species from all 14 of Vermont's counties. 37 volunteers contributed data, along with Spencer Hardy in the back there. He contributed a whole lot of data with me, especially in the first year. 
Before we even started our field season, we went around, gosh, to everywhere, even out of the country, to 24 public and private collections, and we got 2,000, that's actually 2,600 records representing 17 species from all 14 counties. So like I said before, that number is really probably 15 as far as the, the species that we actually had commonly in the state, but three species are gone. What should we do? Tracking and monitoring of declining species by federal and state agencies. Really, really important that we at least keep some sort of monitoring alive. Um, it doesn't have to be something big like we did. It can just be, you know, very, very minimal. Increased outreach to public and farmers. Greater leverage of farm bills, right? So if you're going to ask people to stop mowing or to not plant on as much of their land, you got to compensate them for doing that. Increased oversight of commercial bumblebee industry. So we can go in and out of this country with any insect we want to, and nobody will check your luggage, I guarantee it. And that's definitely a problem. That's how we ended up with pathogen spillover. Basic natural history research. There is so much we don't know about bumblebees. Like, where are they now and what happens to them? So we're pretty sure most of them are in those rodent holes under the snow, but you know, what's the mortality over the winter? Does something go down there and eat them because they're asleep? So we've, we've got really no information on that. Nest site preferences, pollen preferences, really, really important. And then of course, standardized, rigorous bumblebee monitoring program like the one that we did. did you get pesticide oh my gosh, I did? Okay, well, so yeah, obviously, that's really important. <laughs> Thank you for paying attention. Um, so Europe has already banned neonicotinoids and you know I would say that that's really important here in the United States but like I was saying to you before um, neonicotinoids will be banned and something else will be used and so I'm not exactly sure what the answer to that is you know I would love to ban neonicotinoids because they not only have um, lethal effects but there's a lot of sublethal effects that are um, causing populations to decline and so before I take questions and talk um, at length on genetics, I do want to say one word about identification of bumblebees. When they do start to come out in March, you will only be seeing queens at first, the big fluffy things, and then June, July, you'll start seeing the workers. But identifying them can be almost impossible. This is one species. These are the queens, these are the workers, those are the males, and I can guarantee that line actually goes out to about here because there are a lot more different morphs than that. So that's the hardest one, granted, and that one is in Vermont. That's the easiest one, Bombus ternarius, and there's probably another couple of morphs in there somewhere. So um, identifying bees in the field, it can be really, really difficult, but if you, uh, if you can get this one, <laughs> then you can do it. That one's not too hard. All right. Questions? Yes? Could we artificially increase the genetic diversity of the species? I love when you start with a question I can't answer. <laughs> artificially increase the genetic diversity. diversity. I suppose um, by breeding bees that we could do that. Um, but that leaves... Bread bees have problems of their own, so they, they, use them, um, they, they use them to study bees and to study pollen preference and all sorts of things like that, and they've got issues of their own. But I don't see why not. I don't see why that couldn't happen, actually. Good idea. Yes? I hadn't heard about that. That's fantastic, actually. Yeah, I wish we would do that for bumblebees. Um, I think, so I think it would be a little bit more difficult for bumblebees simply because, um, so we know much less about them. They're not domesticated, and there's a lot more species out there. So we're just talking, with the European honeybee, we're just talking about Apis mellifera as opposed to, you know, 
12, 15 species in Vermont, and, and then which one do you decide to, to save? But yeah, it's doable, I suppose. Yes? Hi. Um, I was reading today about monarch butterflies who going through perhaps the first hurdle of being recognized as endangered. And I was wondering if there's any way that these bumblebees might qualify. You, yes, actually. Um, I believe that one or two of them are very soon to be listed in Vermont. Really? And it's partly because Kent McFarland and others petitioned to have them listed. So I'm pretty sure um, it's been waiting until after the election, <laughs> but I think, turn the camera off, <laughs> but I think um, it will very shortly. Uh, Bombus Affinis maybe, Tericola, maybe Ashtonai. So. Very little, um, v really very little. There's no teeth to it, but it's a start. And until, um, until there's more rigorous oversight on a federal level of that pesticide use, um, I don't know that there's, there's gonna be anything else that we can do really. I mean, there, there are things that we can do as individuals, absolutely. And we can still keep you know, talking to politicians and, you know, at the state level and making changes like we have. Um, but yeah, it, it takes a long time. Yes? What do you know about uh, our culture compared to other cultures and their reverence for bees? So maybe you know, India or uh, Africa, uh, is, is there a sense of different you know, connection to bees? I mean, insects have probably come a long way in, in the US and how they're maybe thought of and treated, but I wonder if other cultures have a greater reverence I, that's out of my wheelhouse for sure, but I don't know the answer to that, and that's, that's a really good question. I don't know of any cultures that revere the bumblebee. Um, yeah, I don't know, sorry. I will be looking it up on Google though. <laughs> yes? What are the most nutritious um, plants of the bumblebee? You, you almost said, I think, that the dandelion was... was less nutritious. Yeah, so um, we don't really know necessarily. And so there, there, it's possible that there are different needs for different species. Not, not really likely, but it's possible. Um, and we don't know, we tend to think that the flowers that they go to the most, so the purples and the reds and stuff like that, may be the most nutritious for bumblebees. We don't actually know the answer to that. You guys are great at asking me questions I cannot answer. <laughs> yes. <coughs> so nobody's done studies where they spray paint or something uh, flowers to see if it's a color thing or? Oh, some of it is. So, oh, yeah. Well, so some of it's a color thing. Some of it is an electrostatic charge thing. So the bees can actually sense that electrostatic charge. And so what, what gets really difficult is when you're trying to figure out pollen uh, flower preference in a bumblebee is that there's a lot of components to it. And some of it is pollen, some of it is nectar, some of it is the electrostatic charge that the bee can sense, some of it is a smell that the bee senses. They can tell whether that flower has been visited recently by another bee and how recently. Um, some of it has to do with where the colony is in relation to these flowers, so it all has to be teased out very, very slowly with thousands of people getting their PhD with one question at a time. <laughs> so do you want to talk about genetic diversity for just a second? Okay, I've been dying to get to this. Let me um, see if I can go back. Oh no, that's forward. Rawr. Bumblebee face. Okay, you know what, I'll do it without that. Um, what ends up happening is you have a situation where the, the queen bee has two chromosomes and the male has one chromosome. So each of the worker bees has a 50% chance of getting 50% of her genes from the queen bee. So 50 times 50 is 25%. But she is, each one of them are getting 50% exactly the same because the drone only has one chromosome. So these two worker bees, 
They have 50% exactly the same all the time. And then they have 25%. You add those together, you get on average. So it's never 75% related to each other. They can be 100% related because they get both of the same genes, or they can be 50% related. Fascinating, isn't it? I love it. I know, I know, I know, but sometimes it feels confusing in the middle of things. So, yeah. Uh, do the bumblebees work together to find the flowers? And you know, it's got to be sort of a, a, a constant mix with the different flowers coming up in different, you said it was two kilometers. Yeah, they do work together. So they don't do exactly the waggle dance of the honeybee, but they have, they've just started research into this, into bumblebees doing these little walks once they get back to the colony. And they think those walks um, have something to do with indicating the direction of the pollen source, sort of like the waggle dance does. Um, but they, th we haven't done enough research into it, but we know they do to some degree. So. Yeah, there's a lot we don't know. There really is, unfortunately. Yes? So how many people live at the National Center for Eco Studies that look at bumblebees? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, there's, um, there's two of us, really, Kent and I. Um, but now we're not really doing any work on bumblebees, unfortunately. There's a guy named Leif Richardson who just got his PhD from Dartmouth, and he is now doing a postdoc at UVM. And he is working on, <laughs> do bees self-medicate? And they do. They do. So he's, he's been working on the question of, so you know that there's some toxic flowers out there, like turtle head, right? So why would a bee forage on turtle head? As it turns out, one of the things that Leaf discovered is they forage on turtle head because it kills some of their gut parasites. Well, they forage too much, it makes them sick. They forage just enough, it keeps those gut parasites at bay. So um, that went off on a tangent. Point being, unfortunately, there's only two of us at VCE who really got into the bees, um, and there, there isn't funding for it right now. So, so they switched over to do other things? Yeah, yeah. They've, we, we've always got uh, lots of different projects going on. And um, Kent and I will always kind of keep our hands in the bumblebee thing. Because we love them. Yes, yeah. clearly. <laughs> yeah. I, I couldn't speak to that. Um, not enough is, is the one thing I could say. Um, and they're doing so many different things. So some of them are looking into bumblebee declines, but some of them are doing things far away from that, like do they self-medicate? I, I really couldn't say. Um, I know there's something called the Xerces, sorry, the Xerces Society out in Oregon that does a lot of work on bumblebee decline, and they've got a great website as well. Um, that you can that you can find more bumblebee information about, but I can say exactly how many. Yeah. So, is there an association related to turtle question mm -hmm. of bumblebee diseases? No. There are. We're very underground, though. <laughs> no, um, there are. There are a lot of small groups that sort of get together. Um, there's. Oh, you know what? I'll I'll remember some of them when I'm trying not to. That was the soft one? because you can add Right? I can say whatever I want. Well, okay, let's, let's talk about Vermont. Well, so Vermont is reforesting, which isn't ideal habitat for bumblebees. So in my perfect world, Vermont would stop reforesting right now, and the Bombus affinis would come back, and it would populate its historic range. All the bumblebees would populate their historic ranges. We would get rid of neonicotinoids. I'm not sure how we're going to feed the planet, but we would never use pesticides. Um, There's actually a lot of uh, documentation now that organic, uh, what do you call it, uh, eco-agronomics or something like that could what we're doing right now. Yeah, um, yep. I, I come across that information all the time. I don't know if I'm, you know, 
No, it, I mean, a lot of that is out there. I think, um, I know that LEAF is doing, also, doing research into how bumblebees pollinate blueberries and how they can do that en masse without pesticides. So people are looking into that kind of thing. They are researching it. Him real quick and then you. Um, is, what, what's something that maybe uh, we can do with our own backyards to help out bumblebees? Uh, is there something that we can do? Or just a little yeah, for bees, for monarchs, for all little creatures. Um, not mow so much. We are a nation of mowers. We like everything neat and tidy, but just let it grow. Or, you know, if you don't want to let your whole yard grow, which my husband will not let us do, um, just keep patches, right? Edges around it where um, weed, butterfly weed. What is that thing? Oh, that monarchs eat. Why can't I think? Milkweed. milkweed, thank you. <laughs> Oof. Milkweed. So milkweed is great for bumblebees as well. Um, so all of the native flowers, you don't even have to keep the purple loose strife. You can get rid of that. They love clover. Um, that's one thing that you can do. You can also not use pesticides, right? Obviously, you could not go and get imidacloprid. You can, you know what? On all the things that you buy, that there are a lot of things out there that actually have small amounts of imidacloprid in them, just by reading the labels of anything that you buy at a hardware store that you plan on using around your house. Um, educating yourself on what those long chemical names are is something that you can do, definitely. And you can take pictures of bumblebees and send them to me, and I will maybe be able to tell you what they are. So, yes? Could you say a few words about the relative uh, uh, economics and importance of various species of bumblebees? I suppose honeybees are, uh, they've got the honey industry all to themselves, but they do. they're also used for pollination, aren't they? They are, um, but they, well, f the first thing is they don't pollinate some things as successfully as bumblebees do. So like I said, tomatoes, nothing, nothing pollinates like bumblebees. Then there's also blueberries and cranberries um, and several other things that either bumblebees or some species of solitary bees like mason bees are much better pollinators. And then you have a situation where, um, you know, we've done terrible things to Apis mellifera and they start to decline because of colony collapse disorder. So you need the backups to help them pollinate um, as much as they have been pollinating in the past. Solitary bees can't be transported because they don't go in hives. Now, you're not going to be able to domesticate, at least I, I can't see how you'd be able to domesticate others like you've domesticated the European honeybee. Um, you're just going to have to rely on them to do it naturally, which they do really, really well. Yeah. I think we'll call that the last question, and you'll be here for people to come up. Oh, yeah. Okay. I'll be over there with the bees. <laughs> Happy to answer questions. does have a display of bees in the corner here. Uh, and, uh, I'd also like to mention we have a sign-up sheet uh, for our emails events list if you'd uh, like to know when all our events are coming.